Hello and welcome to the Vedic Conversation, where each episode we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but still very much relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Rory Kinsella, a Vedic meditation teacher from Sydney, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues Derek Yanford in New York and Anthony Thompson in London. This episode was recorded in early May and we're talking about surrender. We look at how we can find strength when we're prepared to let go and surrender. But first, sit back and listen to our stories and then we'll dive into the conversation. As always, don't forget to stick around to the end where we'll offer a practical exercise in how you can apply this knowledge in your daily life. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hello. In my gap year after school, I worked for several months on a farm and really enjoy being on the land. So I decided to go to Israel and work on a kibbutz where I had heard they desperately needed help after the Yom Kippur War. A kibbutz is a kind of collective of people running a farm and they tend to be strong-willed, dynamic and hard-working folk. When I got to this kibbutz, which was up in the north, close to the sea and in the beautiful foothills of the Golan Heights, it was quite clear they were in dire straits. Of the 300 or so people there, more than half had been killed in the war, and there were very few men around to do the hard labour. I was picked to work with a British skinhead who was on the run from the law, and a 40-year-old Frenchman who spoke no English. The three of us were tasked with clearing out five large chicken sheds which had not been touched for over six months. The sheds were huge with several thousand egg-laying chickens in each one forming a white carpet which covered the metre or so of heavily compressed wood chips and chicken poop. We had forks, shovels, a wheelbarrow and a small tipper truck. We couldn't keep the doors open because the chickens would get out, so we had to devise a system whereby we filled the wheelbarrow and then pushed it up the plank to a high window where the tipper truck was waiting. The heat and smell was (laughs) overpowering and our eyes and noses would be streaming from the fumes. Every hour or so we would switch around so that we all had an opportunity of being outside driving the tipper truck and getting some fresh air. Something really interesting happened during that first week. We realized that unless we surrendered to the situation and just got on with it, we were going to be there for a very long time. We were the only people who were going to be clearing those sheds. And despite the fact that there were language, cultural and age differences, we pulled together and surrendered to the task in hand. We would start work at five in the morning to avoid the harsh midday heat. And when we returned to the farm for a meal, we had very few companions because we smelt so bad. Every day we challenged ourselves to see how much we could clear out. And this was always done with a lot of humor and tomfoolery. We knew the job had to be done. We knew it was essential work and we were the only people who were going to do it. And after all, we had volunteered to help and weren't in a position to be choosy. This went on for two and a half months, six days a week. When we finally cleared the sheds and the headman said, well, we could choose any job we wanted on the farm. Every day as we headed off to the sheds, we passed some beautiful orange groves. And that was where I spent the next three months on top of a ladder picking big, juicy, fat, oranges with a sea nearby and a cool breeze blowing. This prize had never been mentioned when we were in the sheds. I didn't know that better jobs were available to us. The thought had crossed my mind that because we had done this hard job so well, they were going to give us some more, knowing we were capable of completing tough tasks. We'd gone to the farm to volunteer to help, been given a big job, got on with it, made it as much fun as possible, job done. By surrendering to the task and the situation in hand with joy in our hearts and grateful for the opportunity to serve, we were given a reward way beyond our imagination. 
oftentimes when we hear the word surrender, we associate it in terms of conflict or war, where one side is giving up or giving in and submits to the demands of the other. I would like to offer an alternative perspective to surrender that is much more empowering. For example, I have a good friend who has cystic fibrosis, who sometimes needs surgery, but because of the conditions of her lungs, cannot be administered anesthesia. I can remember one operation where she was asked to lay still for about four to five hours, completely conscious the entire time. No small feats. Now the way in which she was able to do this successfully was by using surrender. She didn't give up, she didn't give in. What she did was let go and trust. She surrendered or let go of her preference and placed her trust within her doctors. I'm sure there were a thousand other places she would have rather been than motionless in an operating room. However, by surrendering her preference, she was successfully able to endure the entire procedure. Not only did she let go, but she also allowed herself to trust that what was happening was happening for her benefit. She had trust in her team and their abilities to deliver the desired outcome of better health. A few years ago, I was living in a suburb called Tamrama, which is right by the beach. And we lived in this really run down old place that was falling apart and it was freezing cold in the winter. But you could be in the water in 60 seconds flat without even running. And the view was just spectacular. But when it got stormy, the wind would really whip up in from the sea and rain would just be lashing into your face sideways. And you couldn't even open an umbrella without it immediately flying inside out and dragging you off down the road. And my usual response to this was to kind of hunch in my shoulders towards my ears and, you know, walk a bit faster, trying to fool myself that any of this was doing anything to protect me from the rain at all. And then one day I was walking down the hill from where I used to get off the bus on Bondi Road, which is uh, about six or seven minutes walk away, when the heavens just opened. And on this particular day, I didn't have an umbrella. And for some reason, instead of my usual hunching forward and speeding along, I decided, hey, you know what, today I don't care if I get wet. I was only going home anyway and figured I could just easily dry out and, and dry my clothes for the next day. So instead I relaxed into it and enjoyed the novelty of it. Enjoyed this feeling of rain like it was a, a new and interesting sensation rather than as an inconvenience, which is how I usually saw it. And it was pretty liberating and I definitely had a much more enjoyable route home than usual. And this idea of surrendering, what's to, surrendering to what's happening is definitely something I've got better at since I started meditating. When I started, I was always used to, I always used to expect kind of clear mental skies. And then I'd get super disappointed when instead I'd get drenched by these storms of thoughts. But once I accepted that I couldn't control my thoughts, things got a lot easier and more enjoyable. We can't control our thoughts just like we can't control the weather or global events or pandemics. But when we accept these things, we can surrender into the flow of events and enjoy the ride rather than paddling against the current. I loved, I loved how you kind of had that, that whole kind of the moral of the story where you, you applied the idea of surrender to it, I presume with hindsight, but I was wondering if you if you had that idea at the time, or if it's just kind of projecting back that you see that lovely aspect of surrender in it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, at the time, you know, I realized if we didn't just kind of buckle down and get on with it and make it as much fun as possible, it was just going to be a really rough ride. You know, we just realized that the three of us were kind of, in a sense, almost in a sort of a prison prison kind of situation. I mean, the only way we were going to break out was when we'd finished the job. They weren't going to, you know, and we, we weren't the sort of guys who were going to start appealing for help or, you know, let us out, this is terrible, we want to do something else. We realized we had to do the job because 
as I said, you know, the, the, the place was devastated. And the reason, you know, the, the chicken market piled up so high was because nobody cleared it out and it just had to be done. Um, and so it was, it, was a, it was a great adventure. It was a great adventure. But I think at the time, I realized that the only way we were going to get through it was just to kind of go with the flow. We just had to go with it and to make it as much fun as possible in spite of the, the cultural age and, and uh, background differences. We, we just went for it. And we became, you know, we, I wouldn't say we became firm friends, but we were buddies, we were workmates, and, and we had a lot of laughs, you know, made the best of it. But Derek, your story about your friend, I mean, that's amazing, the, the kind of resolve she had to lie there um, fully awake and just trusting you know, in the people around her. And uh, but she, am I right in thinking your friend had had various medical procedures before? And so she was she was kind of used to trusting these particular people. I I know over the course of her life, she's had several procedures and quite a few surgeries and operations. I don't know that any of them were to this extent of this one that I was talking about in the story for that long. I think she's had ones in the past where it's maybe like 30 or 45 minutes, but I want to say there was really some really big decisions around even doing it because it was going to be such a long time. And I, I, I want to say, I know that the doctors and the nurses applauded her afterwards because they were surprised really that she could do it. You know, and I want to say she didn't make a sound either. Like that was the thing. She couldn't, she couldn't move. She couldn't change her posture or position. Um, you know, and, and cystic fibrosis, usually people who have it are coughing quite a bit because there's fluid that gathers in the lungs. I don't think she was allowed to cough either, you know? And the thing about it is I want to say she, at, at, I think she's the oldest living person with cystic fibrosis. So she's had a history of it since she was very, very young. And she's just really come to realize, look, this is it. I, I, I want to say doctors have told her before she shouldn't be living. Um, her time to expire happened a long time ago and she's pushed those limits. She has two beautiful children. So she's got a lot to live for. It's really, you know, quite inspiring. And I, you know, I try to imagine what that would be like or when I'm thinking about surrendering. And usually that comes when I'm feeling resistance. I think about her sometimes and I go, okay, could you do that? Could, could you be motionless for four or five hours while a swarm of doctors are working on you? Which I can only imagine... You know, I, I think she said she did have tears that were running down her eyes at points because, I mean, it's invasive and, you know, they're, they're using instruments to, to cut into her flesh that cannot be comfortable. But I think what she was able to do was understand how important it was to go through it. And so maybe she could also like vacate in the sense of not really identifying with being there at the time. And I would imagine the mental preparation before you have to go through to, go, to understand this is what it, it needs to be. And so anytime I'm feeling resistance, that, that point where I want to not do, um, it's really interesting because I think of her and it helps me trigger surrender and that when I think about my, myself having to surrender, I, I can't think of an instance that that's, it's that great. So she's, she's provided a lot of inspiration for me and I hope to, to other people as well. I mean, I it's, it's very powerful. Yeah. Um, Sorry, excuse me. I was just wondering whether she had a very strong vision of the time after the operation, whether she was kind of projecting forward uh, that was kind of pulling her through this this ordeal. Did you ever find out whether that was the case? Well, her children, at the time, her kids were still in high school, I think. And one of them was going to be graduating and going to college. Okay. 
And I know that she had this vision of seeing her daughter graduate from college. And then she had a younger son as well. And she had the vision to see him graduate, but she's all, you know, she's at that place where she knows that she kind of has to take it one day at a time kind of a thing. So I do think she does look ahead. Hopefully I can tell you this. I've been with her in restaurants where she has to give herself an injection at the table and she's very like nonchalant about it. She'll just go, okay, you, you know, the first time it happened, she's like, don't worry about anything. And she just kind of did it. And it's not a big deal because she makes it not into a big deal, but it, it's her will to survive. That's so strong. She's been through a litany of other things. So I think if, if anything, she has the possibility to imagine the best case scenario and because she's defeated the odds, every challenge I think just becomes one more. How is this different than, than the last one? And I don't know if she, you know, she realizes how strong she is either, but I, I, I can say, you know, when, when I, just thinking about her right now, I think, wow. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can do it or I can, I can try to surrender and, and have those results. It, it makes me think of, <clears throat> you know, this is a much smaller example, you know, in the face of that amazing, that amazing lady, but I've always been really, really bad going to the dentist and my dentist who's quite a good friend of mine now on my form he was telling me that he had the word gaga written down because whenever he tried to go anywhere near my mouth i'd be freaking out just going no i can't do this i can't have this person fiddling around in my mouth and (laughs) this this he was my dentist both before i learned to meditate and and after and a couple of you know i i hadn't been for a couple of years and came back after i'd learned to meditate and he was like Rory, what, what, what's changed? You're not flipping out in the, in the chair. You're not trying to bite my fingers off. And I was telling him after, it's like, I've learned to meditate. And it had made me realize that I could then lie there in the chair and, you know, kind of surrender to it. Because I guess what, what I'd realized, you know, through, you know, meditation helps you remove stress and all those things which are going to physically help you. But surrendering to the situation of, I'm going to have to have my tooth out anyway whether I'm imagining trying to control it or wondering what's going to happen or or any of those things, it's not going to change it. It's actually going to work against it. If I'm the gagger, I'm the kind of problem patient there and I'm making it harder for him. I'm making it more likely that he's going to hurt me because I'm, you know, making his job hard. So it's that, you know, aspect of surrendering to that experience means that not only is it going to be more pleasant for you? You're probably going to get a better situation, you know, in my quite mundane version of the dentist. But I think it, what, what's great about surrender is then it can, it can play out in, in every possible situation. Because for me, it's like if, if you're not surrendered, you're trying to second guess everything. You're trying to manipulate things. You're trying to control. And if you're trying to control your your you're not in the flow of events. You're not seeing what possible opportunities are around because while you're trying to control, you're up in your head and you're having this kind of second narrative of not what's going on, but what I want to be going on. And that, you know, that creates this kind of divide. And it means that there's this, yeah, there's, there's this, there's this unnecessary tension between what you think should be happening and what is happening. And I think one of the things that I love about, having become a meditator is that you just, you you can choose to get rid of that whole narrative. So, you know, say in the pandemic now, rather than worrying about what's going to happen next week or what's going to happen in two weeks or, you know, when things are going to change, you just go, well, no, I'm just going to surrender to what's happening and what, what can I do now? And what, you know, what's the benefit of being trapped at home and having to do things on video. And we've, you know, we've had lots of benefits of, positive changes so rather than trying to turn it all into what I thought should be happening this aspect of surrender just means that it's 
stuff's so much easier because you just go, all right, well, this is what's happening. It's like, you know, for, for my story, if I just switch to that, I, you know, it's not as powerful or maybe as um, evocative as, as your two, but I love talking when I teach about the weather because it's one of those things where you say, look, everyone knows what the weather's like and no one can control it, you know, or maybe, maybe some secret Chinese department can, but... <laughs> With the weather, it's just such a simple everyday thing of, you know, it's raining and you see those people who are like, I can't believe it's raining. You've ruined my day. You've, you know, ruined this, you've ruined that. And it's like, look, we can't control the weather. So all we can control is our, our reactions to it. So if you go, right, I'm going to accept that the rain is, is falling. I just had that, that incident where I just, just decided I don't care if I get wet. And that's a very, I guess, simple but yeah everyday version of going I, I I remember that it was you know several years ago ago now but I remember the, the freedom of saying right I'm now I'm going to surrender into my into my everyday experience and it just changes everything like it's going to rain whether you like it or not so it's it's you saying right I'm going to react to it and it's you know it's similar to what you were saying about your friend like she's not she accepts that this is the situation and it's that part of acceptance which just means that you can become a lot more resourceful and a lot, a lot more productive and then, you know, make the most of whatever life is giving you. I have this great vision of you, Rory, when it rains, of sort of being an Antipodean version of Gene Kelly singing and you know, dancing in the rain. <laughs> now, I'm sure you now just dispense with umbrellas and just go for it. Well, actually, I, was, I, I posted a story about this the other day and all my English friends were like, yeah, that sounds well and good, but not when it's cold because the rain here is always <laughs> normally in the summer and it's actually quite warm and nice. But I remember English weather where it's like it's zero degrees and it's raining and then you're, you're not surrendering then. <laughs> I think you make a very interesting point about this um, acceptance and um, I'm just reminded of that kind of interesting tension between being stable and being adaptable. That, you know, one is allowing, acknowledging the situation and not fighting it, that you're going, going along with it. And that gives you a degree of stability because then you know what's what. But at the same time, one's also trying to be adaptable so that whatever next comes along, um, you can ride that. And I think there's always this kind of interesting kind of sway between adaptability and um, stability that's kind of always in play. And um, I think, you know, all our stories kind of illustrate that to a greater or lesser degree, that there is this, um, that, you know, we, we need to be stable, we need to be grounded. Um, but from that, we don't want to become rigidly attached to that stability because then nothing's going to give and we're not going to give up anything and we're going to become rigid. But then we need to be adaptable so that we can then move forward and evolve and grow and flourish. Yeah, it's, it's I, I, I agree with that completely. I, I think the one other element I'd love to add to that is power and how surrendering can be empowering over how it can be disempowering because I feel if you ask someone to surrender it almost insinuates them giving up or giving in and then thus rendering them powerless and so when people are rigidly attached and they want to hold on they want to exercise their power to get what it is that they want and I can I think we all can from experience understand that surrendering is powerful in the sense that you can probably get the thing that you're looking to get faster with less friction if instead of holding on that go-to feeling of i have to make this happen letting go in a variety of scenarios if in traffic you know i used to be that guy who would be kind of upset if the traffic wasn't moving the way that I wanted to, or if you're at a grocery store, maybe even right now, and you have to wait in a very long line. I remember one time I was with a, a friend of mine and we were at a store and whoever happened to be 
at the cash register was taking quite a long time. She, she was a little discombobulated, wasn't sure where things were. And I said nothing. I just let her do her thing. She asked me a couple questions and then I ended up getting whatever it was I wanted, but it was an exorbitant amount of time. And then when we went to go and sit down, my friend turned to me, he's like, wow, you're so patient. And I was like, yes, because I know that if I surrender, I'm going to get what I want. It's going to happen. It's going to, it's going to come to me. And if I don't, it might still come to me, but it's going to feel a lot worse. If I get angry, if I get upset, if I engage in a way that, you know, I want to demonstrate my power over somebody, I could maybe get it, but is it going to feel as good? I don't think so. So I, I think it's important to underscore that there's the power of surrender that will work in your favor, as opposed to the idea of it, you know, disempowering you because surrender sounds like giving up and i think i think of it more as letting go there's nothing that you've given up you've just understood the situation for what it is and you you don't like we said you don't have that rigid attachment to the outcome you let go which provides all this energy to kind of flow through you and it and then end up happening the way really what you want yeah, and it may be that you get that circumstances give you something you didn't even know you wanted, but ends up being, you know, maybe you, your your bus is late, you get somewhere late, but then you end up meeting your life partner or you miss a, pl- a plane that ends up crashing or any of these things where you're like, oh, hang on, if, I, if, if my way went to plan, things could have gone, I could have missed these opportunities. So it's recognizing, I think also that we're, we we don't know everything that's going on and you know we don't know anything if, if you think of the trillions of things that go on in our bodies we we don't know about hardly any of them and and if you think about that extrapolated to the to the whole world that's it's having this idea that we we know what's best is is kind of mm-hmm. is it's laughable so it's surrendering to to saying you know i trust that events are going to go my way even if they at the time they don't look like they are so I, I'm talking to my students at the moment about how we didn't we didn't anticipate this pandemic and it looks like it's a complete disaster but we always have status quo and then there's a dip and then there's a higher status quo so it's just trusting that good things will come out of it even if you can't see them at the time and I think it's that surrendering is just that trust element of of letting go of your yeah your preconceived ideas of what you thought would happen for the benefit of seeing these new possibilities which when when you manage to do that it means it gives you hope and it and it lets you open your eyes to see you know who can i see from my queue in the post office that that you know why am i here why am i being held here for this reason and maybe you see a book on the stand or someone you've not seen for a while who, you know, you then teach to meditate or whatever it might be, but it's just letting go to, 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 to accepting what's happening there and seeing what possibilities are around you. I absolutely agree. I think, I think, you know, this, it opens up this huge arena of possibilities. And I think what you were referring to Derek in a sense is, you know, the response to the stimulus, we have a choice as how we're going to respond to something. And I think when we, when we become meditators, we understand that we have much more time to consider what the response is going to be. I mean, this is something that, that Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist who was imprisoned in the Second World War, sort of really examined. He couldn't understand why it was that young, fit, healthy people in the camps were dying when he really expected the elderly people uh, to be perishing. And he realized that it was the younger people who didn't have a healthy response to the stimuli around them. And they let the stimuli overpower them. So going back to your point about surrender, you know, there is a choice. You know, if somebody, obviously if somebody's holding a gun at our head and says, you know, surrender, we're probably gonna make the obvious choice. But, but you know, we don't have to, there is a choice. There is a choice. 
And there's the stimulus. How are we going to respond? And I, I always say that, you know, as meditators, we kind of, we get into the gap between the stimulus and the response. That there's just, you know, it's, we're talking about micro, microseconds. But because we're aware, we have, we have greater awareness, we're training ourselves to be more aware, we're more receptive to what's going on. We then can just, uh, we can adjust our response, which can be hugely beneficial to everybody concerned that we don't get angry, that we we take the heat out of the situation rather than just defaulting to the, well, that always makes me angry, so I'm going to be angry. It's the precognitive commitment, you know, that we are committed to behaving in a certain way because that's our habitual response. But as meditators, I think we, we understand that actually we can change that. And so life becomes a lot easier. There's less friction. I think... Rory, when you were talking about um, possibilities, that I was like, right, because there's a myriad of things that could could happen. And then Anthony, when you were talking about preferences, then I I thought about right, it's a preference, right? There's all these things that could happen. I stand or I'm situated in a position where I would prefer a particular thing to happen. And then I can choose to either surrender that preference or not. And I think that's, that's the other thing that kind of helps change the paradigm a little bit for me speaking about this right now is that I have a litany of preferences and some of them I'm always having, I'm always enjoying my preference. And so it might stand to reason you could surrender this one. You, you have this one. Okay. Surrender this one, see what happens by surrendering your preferences doesn't mean that all your privileges are taken away. It's just, it doesn't, and it, preference kind of, you know, has this idea that it's the preferred thing, but it's not the must. It's not the end all be all. So surrendering to choose so surrendering your preference to open up the world of possibilities encourages me to do it even more frequently, I think, you know, because I, I actually am interested in seeing what the other possibilities are available to me that I can't see when I'm stuck with, you know, making sure my preference gets served. Yeah, and, you know, that, that plays into this bigger idea of, in this bigger Vedic idea of surrendering preferences, which, you know, often for me, it's surrendering the preference of being right. So, you know, if, if you think of a classic example between you know, someone and their partner, you know, if I'm arguing with my girlfriend, you know, about something stupid, like what's the capital of Mongolia or something. <laughs> and, and I, I know I'm right, but I, I may surrender the preference for being right so that we don't not talk for three hours, or I may, we may be talking about what film to go to. Um, and I may surrender my preference to see, you know, some, spiritual vedic film because i know she'll get bored by it so we'll we'll instead go and see something that we'll both enjoy it's these we can either think think about surrendering preferences in kind of big life or death situations or in these much more everyday ones but like you were saying it's always or anthony what you were saying by surrendering we'll end up having this more comfortable more enjoyable ride and and it all happens in that split second like when i talk to meditators who are asking how do i track my progress it's in those split second decisions so i used to get really angry if someone at the airline desk you know said my flight i couldn't have the seat i wanted you know i, I love the aisle seat <laughs> for example <laughs> and i would you know get get start swearing at them and all this and then i found over time after i started meditating that i was just like okay fine I know I'm not going to change this. So rather than being one of those people on one of those airport shows who are <laughs> throwing their baggage around, I'm just going to go fine. All right. You know, I'm going to surrender to this and, you know, see what the benefits of a middle middle seat are or whatever it might be, and because you're not going to change that or you might change it, but <laughs> um, it's much easier for you to just go, right, I'm going to accept this, have a nice friendly interaction and then, and then move on. And like you said, Derek, the more you choose to do that, the more of those opportunities arise. And I think over time that we realize that there are 
thousands of places where we could be doing it. And as we get older and, and you know, more mature as meditators, we start to be able to see more and more of those. I think also there's, there's the surrender of the ego and the surrender of the intellect that, you know, so often the ego is at play in all these, all these situations that, you know, that, you know, I want to maintain my status. I need to maintain my position. And actually, does it make any difference at all in the big scheme of things? Absolutely none whatsoever. It's just misplaced ego at that time. And I think what that's something that, um, you know, we all have ego and it's important to have ego. But when we talk about somebody's ego, we're usually talking about a misplaced ego, that their ego is playing out inappropriately for that set of circumstances or that particular situation. And, you know, so often I catch myself thinking, you know, what, why, why am I thinking this? Is it, is it the little me or is it the big me? You know, what, what is at play here? What's at play here? And actually when you, and as you were saying, Rory, it just becomes second nature. You, you, you can recognize the telltale signs. You say, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that game plan. Now nah, it's, it's completely pointless, pointless. It doesn't get us anywhere. You know? Yeah. There's this beautiful uh, quote from Jung that I read the other day that said the first half of life is about building a healthy ego and then the second half of life is about letting go of that ego, <laughs> which, you know, as a middle-aged person myself, I was like, that's so true. And, it, you know, that post got lots of likes because it's so simple. And I think, you know, it really sums up what the spiritual journey is about in, in just such an easy way. It's not saying that ego is bad. It's just saying that it's, it goes a certain way. And then, I guess similar to what you were saying before, Anthony, it's about everything's about balance. It's about finding that middle ground between stability and adaptation. And it's it's you know they call it in Taoism they call it the Tao, the the way. And it's about finding that that middle ground. And everywhere where we go, we can we can tread that line. And as meditators we have more of a clear view of what, what that line is because we're not stuck in these, these stresses we had before and every other time that I was in the airline queue and I didn't get my right seat, those things that I never processed out, I'm bringing them to the table. Whereas as meditators, we clear out all that stress and then you can just take every situation as it presents itself and then it's much easier to let go of those things because you, you've not got the thousand other times and you think it's, you know, if you don't do it, you're somehow weak, but it's not like that at all. It's, you know, you're stronger when you're, you're able to give these things up because you don't rely on that position of I am right. You're bigger mm. than that. Like you said, it's that big self going, okay, I can be bigger here, which is something that's, you know, great to feel as a, as a progressing meditator. Mm -hmm. Lovely. You guys, this has been lovely. I mean, it, it just reminds me, poignantly of a story maybe you both have heard of Tom talking about wanting to play with his daughter one of his children when she was very young and asking him daddy please pretend to be a unicorn you know which even for myself it's like I'm not a unicorn I don't know that I want to pretend that I'm a unicorn but <laughs> The beauty in surrendering, surrendering your preference, preference, knowing that, yes, I'm not a unicorn. When you do that, you, then you're able to have this experience with another person who might be, you know, in a different state of consciousness than you are at. And it's because you can surrender your preference to be experiencing yourself as whatever it is that you are currently so that you can do it with somebody else especially your child or someone else's child and have that play and just kind of get lost in the fantasy of whatever comes out. It's something I always think about because, you know, I, as a dance teacher, I work with a lot of children, but sometimes not so much now, but before I used to take myself so seriously that I was the teacher and they were the student. And after hearing that story, I realized again what it was like 
to be a child and the way that children look at things and the way that they want to experience things. And I think every child has this desire to be with somebody who's older, but in a way that that's childlike like they are. And I have to remember that. It almost seems as though too, now that, you, now that I'm thinking about it, that perhaps surrendering almost delivers us the experience of being in the present moment because somehow the preference that we have that we're surrendering is about the future. Something that we are wanting to create happen that hasn't happened yet. And when we surrender that, we put aside the idea of bringing the future to us or getting into the future, maybe a little bit more quickly. What do we have to do? We have to be where we are at the moment right now. So it sounds like, which I've never, until we're really talking about it, thought of it that way. Surrendering almost means be here now. Be here now. Forget what it is that you wanted. Forget the plans that you know you were making to go in a particular direction. Be here now. And I think we all know that that's where all the goodies are. All the joy, all the love, all the happiness, all the things that we're really wanting to experience only live in one place and that's the present moment you know when I, in my intro talks people often talk about you know how's vedic different to mindfulness and that whole aspect you were talking about there of being in the present moment and surrendering to the present moment they're not kind of separate um you know opposed things because I, I studied mindfulness for six months before i came to vedic and we're I guess how they differ is that mindfulness is, is the practice itself is putting yourself in the moment. Whereas I guess what we do allows us to be more mind, more mindful and more present because what we're doing is processing out all these stresses and stress triggers, which keep us in our past and keep us in our heads. So what I like about these practices is they're not, you know, they're all from this ancient body of, wisdom and they're just different manifestations of it so it's it's like you don't have to not be mindful you know the, what the benefit of our practice of this type of vedic meditation where we use a, a mantra is that we're then more able to be mindful and what what i like about those mindfulness practices is they always talk about you can be mindful when you're doing the dishes or you can be mindful when you're tending to the garden it's it's just being surrendering to the to the present moment but i think it's much easier to do that if you have an established meditation practice which helps you remove that stress because otherwise you're just complaining about you know you're overthinking your surrender to the to the dishes because you've got all this stuff in your head that you've not processed yet so i think that you're much more able to have that surrendering to the present moment ability if you have a separate way of dealing with these stresses that you carry around which is a sit down meditation practice whether that's a mindfulness one or a vedic one pick pick whichever one works for you I, you know they're not if a meditation practice has been around for thousands of years and millions of people practice it it works it's just about finding one that works for you and i couldn't make a daily habit of mindfulness because i didn't enjoy it i didn't enjoy the sensation of feeling my breath it, it felt a bit forced and made me imagine the inside of my my lungs which was a bit more of a like a medical procedure whereas with vedic as you know we use a an internal sound or a, a mantra that we we say in our heads and for me using that as an anchor was a lot more settling because because sound and music is is naturally settling to me and to many people and it just meant that after I practiced it the first time, I was like, oh, well, this is enjoyable. I don't have to force myself to do this. It's not like making myself eat my broccoli when I was a child that I didn't like. This was just like, oh, this is great. And it also happens to be good for me, you know, more like an apple where you go, this is sweet and, and delicious. Um, mm. so I think it's key for people, especially people who don't have a meditation practice to, to say that, you know, there are different ones to try and some of them are just going to click with you so that it's not going to be such a chore to do. You're going to be like, I enjoy doing this. I'm going to do it every day. I certainly find with new students, one of the biggest challenges is the idea of surrendering to the 20 minutes and just allowing whatever happens to happen. And 
you know, for so many people, they are controlling their lives. They're micromanaging their lives, always, you know, trying to determine the outcome. And I say, you know, we're doing that for 23 hours and 20 minutes of our day. But just, just for 20 minutes, we're not in control. It's only 20 minutes. You can be in control for the other 23 hours and 20 minutes, but just these 20 minutes, you're not in control. You're just the passenger. You're just the observer. You're just going to witness what's happening. You're setting up the 20 minute frame, that environment. You're getting comfortable. You're going to be somewhere where you're undisturbed. And then you're just going to let it flow and see what happens and just be a nonchalant observer and go for the ride. And, and the ride is different every single time. That's what's so endlessly fascinating. You know, people say, well, yeah, how can you, what do you mean you do it twice a day, every day? I mean, God, it must get so boring. No, <laughs> it doesn't because, you know, we can all speak from experience that every single meditation is completely different. And it's all just one, you know, it's an, an amazing, it's an amazing ride. It's, it's such a great surprise, you know, it's, um, everyone has a different flavor. Okay, thank you for watching to the end. Each episode we offer a takeaway, a practical exercise you can do at home to apply this knowledge in your own life. In this episode we were talking about surrender and how you can find strength when you let go. This week your challenge is to let go of something you've been holding on to or resisting, to surrender a preference. So see if you can think of a pet peeve you have or something that annoys you about either your partner or a friend or perhaps even a pet. And next time they annoy you, see if you can surrender the feeling and move above it. See if instead you can appreciate the greater feeling of connection that you experience with this person and see how it makes you feel. And if you're happy to share your stories, we'd love to hear them. And we'd love for you to join the conversation. Please send them through to us at stories at the Vedic Conversation.com or post them on social media with the hashtag the Vedic Conversation. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your followers and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.